Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Handyman Success Podcast. Here we are joined by Ben Alexander of Hank's Handyman. And here on this podcast, our mission is to inspire others by listening to other people's handyman stories, specifically how they started up, how they price, how they market. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. We got Ben Alexander here, like I said. My name is Alan Lee, one of the co-hosts, uh, joined with Jason Call, the fabulous Jason Call. So, um, so Ben, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, your business, um, and then we'll kind of move on from there. Yeah, sure. No problem. So, um, like I said, my name is Ben Alexander. We're based here out of, uh, Garland, which is a suburb of Dallas. So I guess we're 15 minutes, uh, Northeast of Dallas. Um, my background is home services. So, um, I've been doing this hard to believe it, but 20 years um, on the heating and air conditioning side. So um, I started out in a, a trade school called Lincoln Tech. And then I worked new construction doing uh, HVAC startups and I did service and I did sales. Uh, then I did some new construction stuff, decided to start my own HVAC company, uh, went through some business partner troubles, you know, that didn't work out well. So this was actually my third business to start from scratch. Um, you learned a lot the first two, for sure, what to do and what not to do. Um, but uh, I guess two and a half, about three years ago at this time, they uh, my, my current business partners on a heating and air conditioning home service company. I was managing and helping them grow that for five and a half years, and I was bored. And they saw a great opportunity in the DFW market to focus on customer service um, high quality work, workmanship warranty that nobody would dare to write on paper. And uh, they approached me and asked me if I wanted to take a run at it. And and here we are two and a half, yeah, two and a half years later. So I guess we ran our first call in August of 2019. And then our second call, uh, we actually ended up having to refund the whole entire thing. <laughs> the second day of August, I, I was scratching my head like, oh God, here we go. Let's see how this is going to work. And it was a dryer vent cleaning that we messed up on it was like 110 bucks is our second job and we had to refund that lady her money go back and fix it again so hmm. um but but that's that's me um you know hank's handyman um i currently have 32 employees we wow. over the past two months we've lost about six guys in our field um the labor market's extremely tough um, people are offering insane amounts of money to come do construction type work in the DFW market. So um, that's currently my largest struggle is manpower. Hmm. But um, we're still doing good. Um, we're still on track to do roughly 4.8 to 5 million in, in revenue. Dang. For, <laughs> this is our third calendar year. So wow. awesome, man. Uh, it's pretty good. A quick question on, so you have 32 employees. Uh, do you mind shedding a little light on like the, the distribution there? Like how many techs, how many office folks, you know, estimators, things like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically I try to keep one handyman apprentice per five handyman. Um, I'll kind of start at the bottom, work my way all the way up. Um, and we currently have 13 handyman trucks on the road. So those guys are broke up into tier levels. So I have a level one, level two, and level three handyman. All right. So we, I was having some issues primarily scheduling people. So when somebody calls into our call center, I needed a way for the person answering the phone to figure out our scheduling availability and what handyman to send to what job. Mm -hmm. So if somebody calls in and says, hey, I got a sheetrock repair some painting and a ceiling fan that needs to be changed. We know, and the, the guys and girls in our call center know that um, an entry level, level one guy can do that. So that's when we look, see when they're available and book the call. Um, somebody calls in and they got the same thing. Say they got a sheet rock repair, ceiling fan, some painting, and then they need a shower pan tiled. Well, we know our level three guys are the only guys that can do the shower pan. That's the hardest skill that we have. So we would send the level three because he can do all these simpler tasks. So we kind of base that off the most difficult, most complex task. Okay. And when we're taking um, 
Last week, we took 160 phone calls. I think we booked 97 of those. Wow. Week before that was 179 phone calls. So we really needed a way to get the right man to the right job. Mm -hmm. So... So you have it kind of processed out like for your, uh, I'm, I'm assuming in-house call center. Do you have customer yes. service reps in the office there with you? Yep. So you, you have things processed out like the, the type of jobs for each tech and then the, the customer service rep then kind of evaluates on the spot uh, to try and try and get them on the right schedule with the right guy. Right. For example, my level one guy, you know, they can patch any wall. Um, they have to be able to match um, our five most common types of texture. They need to be able to paint just about anything, hang anything on any surface. So, you know, mirrors, brick, you know, mirrors, TVs on brick and masonry, inside, outside. They need to be able to do um, attic ladders. Let's see what else. I should pull it up in front of me, but um, they, they need to be... Um, have general carpentry skills. So anything's with like 90s and 45s, um, not necessarily, you know, I'm not going to go send them to build a bookcase, but, you know, if they're going to replace a baseboard, trim around the door or something like that. And then also they need to be able to like replace doors. So we have lined out criteria for each level, level one, level two, and level three. Mm -hmm. And that's how we classify the guys. So it doesn't always work out that way we're really kind of at the expense of the customer and the CEP on the phone, pulling the information out of the homeowner as far as what, what task are you needing? So I can try to identify the most complicated one and get the right guy out there. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. So, so can you, can you tell me a little bit about your apprentice? Um, like, so what, cause I know that there's some guys out there that, you know, are just one man, one man shops, but they're, they're kind of thinking about, you know, maybe hiring on a, a you know, a younger guy, an apprentice helping him, you know, up. And I, it's, it sure is handy to have another hand on the job. So can you tell us kind of like, cause you have one apprentice per five technicians, what justifies sending that appre apprentice to the technician? And does that apprentice kind of make their own schedule or do you kind of tell them where to go? So we definitely tell them where to go. So there's two routes that apprentice gets assigned riding with a, a handyman is either, you know, for example, if we have an attic ladder install booked, we automatically send an apprentice to those for safety reasons. We don't want one guy mm -hmm. holding that attic stairs above his head or two, the handyman guys, if they sell a job, they know that they're going to need help. So they'll do what's called a job return, go back, you know, the, reschedule the job, go at a following date and say they got 30 sheetrock patches or man, I mean, there, there's no telling a lot of lumber to move. Mm -hmm. um, they need an extension ladder. So they need, you know, additional help for safety reasons. So those are the primary reasons why we, we have them that, and our hope is that within a year they learn and they try to get into an entry level handyman position and, and mm -hmm. run their own truck. Okay. okay. That was my question. The the goal of the apprentice, like they indicate a desire to um, kind of become that that handyman level one, and then move up from there. Like they they exhibit that kind of desire to, you know, they want to learn, but they don't have the experience yet. Is that basically the the bill that, that that's who fits in that role? Yeah. So I'll hire guys with absolutely no relative trade experience. Um, they have a little bit longer road. Um, I typically look for somebody with six months to a year of um, painting, drywall, carpentry, some relative experience to build off of. Um, I like it if they have painting skills or sheetrock skills or carpentry, because I know they ha at least know how to read a tape measure. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of drywall work. So, you know, I, it's a good base to build mm -hmm. on. Um, as far as... Uh... <clears throat> like fitting handyman into the, you know, apprentice, I, I feel like that's a pretty straightforward, you know, is a good fit for that. But one, two, and three, is, is that based on their experience? Is it based on like a skills test? Is there training that they go through to then level up or a combination of all those? Like how, how do you kind of work someone through that? Well, so during the interview process, application process, we have a list in no specific order of all the skills that are based in out of one, two, and three. And it says at the top, you know, mark every box of what you can do today proficiently by yourself. Mm -hmm. 
and there's no right or wrong answer for the applicant. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, us having a baseline of questions to ask during the interview process. So if they mark drywall repairs, I'm going to ask them in the, in the interview process. So tell, tell me how you go about a 12 by 12 drywall, drywall repair. Mm -hmm. Like what tools do you use? What materials do you use? How long does it take you to dry? Do you do it in one trip or two? Because we do drywall pairs in one trip. But so I, I just ask relative questions you know, and listen to what the, the guy I'm interviewing has to say. If he knows what hot patch is, 20 minute mud is, if he knows, you know, he can wet sand it, dry sand it. Like, is he telling me stuff that's accurate? Mm -hmm. Or is he saying, I go get that tool from the truck and he doesn't even know the name of the tools. You know, all those are big red flags. When we first started doing this, everybody would show me like all these uh, great pictures that I swear they took off home, better homes and gardens because they, their work didn't look like the work that they showed me in the interview. So I gave up on looking at pictures. I just decided that I'm going to ask questions and listen to your responses. So mm -hmm. um, if a guy says, you know, he's done a lot of attic stairs, I'll ask him what the process is and what tools he uses. Can he do it by himself? Just relevant questions to get mm -hmm. them talking and get them telling you, you know, what they right. can and can't do and see. Mm -hmm. Does this guy actually know what he's talking about? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, you said one thing earlier, which I was interested in, is how do you guys do your sales? Because I think you had mentioned possibly it sounded like that your technicians actually sell the jobs. Or do you have estimators yeah. in the office? What well, let me, like? let me finish running through the um, kind of how we got the company structured. So we got the handyman apprentices. Then we have the okay. three different levels of handyman. Um, then I have a service manager for them in the office. I actually have two now. So okay. I have the level three guys under one manager and the entry level one and twos under another service manager. So I'm currently overstaffed, but I'm preparing for growth. So I okay. have two. So the um, uh, make sure that those guys, is that kind of the middle person between the customer service reps and, uh, and the actual technician going out? Yes. Yep. Um, and then we have a remodel side, which... We call it remodel. We don't do home whole home remodels. We might do a bedroom. We might do two bedrooms, you know, painting, patching walls, kind of just bringing things up to date. Now we do quite a bit of bathrooms and we have some, some kitchens, but we're doing kitchen refacing, not kitchen remodeling. Okay. Um, the margins are substantially better because I don't have to buy all the cabinets. So, um, with that being said, the way that's structured is I have um, a supervisor, which I called a, a remodel director. And then I have currently have three leads. So I have three trucks. Each truck has a lead and then a remodel apprentice, which is essentially a helper slash trainee. And the goal okay. with those guys are within, you know, six months to a year, they're ready to take their, their guy's job. And hopefully their guy moves up to something else. Or okay. we multiply, you know, we currently have three. The plan is to end the year with five of those trucks. Uh, um, and so, and actually, I don't know if you can see it on this board. It's hard to see, but that's kind of planning for the whole entire growth of the remodel. Okay. Um, we do a lot of planning. But when you grow this fast, you better. Yeah. Um, and then, let me think here. I think that covers remodel. That covers handyman side. Um Distinction, you, uh, if I recall correctly, you said 13 total trucks. So three are the remodel, dedicated to that remodeling, kitchen refacing side, and then 10 handyman? 13 handyman, okay. um, three remodel. Okay. Um, and then my field, my remodel supervisor, he has a company vehicle. Um, he is in the office about an hour and a half to two hours in the morning. The rest of the day, he's making his rounds through each of the remodel projects. Sometimes he's picking up materials. Sometimes he's putting out fires. He's talking to customers. You know, sometimes if our, our guys get hung up on a job, he can run by and, and help them out, get unhung up. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's primarily what he does all day long. And then he's also capable of running an estimate if needed. These guys are really rude. Sorry. <laughs> 
I have a window right in front of me <laughs> and they're dancing for me. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I moved my computer. Um, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're mean, I'm going to make Austin come in and talk on the podcast. He's one of my service managers and then he'll hate me. Is he the level one and two or level three? He's the level three. So he's been, oh. I promoted him from the field and he was actually my first service manager besides myself. Okay. So um, he's actually just been promoted to a field director. So he's overseeing the service managers, the remodel managers, and all the crews underneath him. So wow. we're just kind of moving people around, changing directions a little bit. Mm -hmm. He also manages the estimators who go out, which I currently have one full time. And then, and then my remodel director, he goes and takes the overflow estimates. So, okay. you know, but then I have a full time estimator named Daniel. Um, if somebody calls in and says, that they need to, you know, if they want something done, I'm really just trying to get an estimate for next week, next month, whatever it may be. We try to, to not send the handyman guys. We try to send them on stuff that they can quote mm -hmm. and get started on right away. And if we feel like that, this is a customer who's really just wanting to get a price or their project is something that could be scheduled out for a few weeks down the road, we'll send the estimator. Um, the estimator is a much better communicator than most of my handyman guys is, <laughs> is. So, you know, his closing percentage and his average tickets higher. Mm -hmm. So we want to send him to as many of those jobs as we can. So we typically run him three or four of those a day. Okay. So I know last year he produced about 750,000 in revenue. So I imagine this year, I think his goal is about 850 to 900. So it's been a little slow start, but we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And that that makes up my whole field, essentially. Okay. And then on the office side, so I have an accounting manager, and she has two part-time people that work under her, right? So they do anything with money, payroll, um, taxes, invoicing, collections. Um, man, if it involves money, it goes to Sarah who's my accounting manager. Mm -hmm. And then I have Sarah, I'm sorry, Erin, who is my call center manager. So she has uh, herself answering booking calls, dispatching technicians. So she, they run the schedule every day. And then we have a guy named Gary who does the same. And then, uh, oh man, Dustin, who also does the same, but his primary role is that he is the project coordinator. This is a new role that we started in January of this year. Mm -hmm. So he's taking all of the bigger estimates. Everybody loves me. I'm going to make you get on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes all the estimates. He types them up into our format. He emails them out. Um, we use a service that we can see when the customer actually opens the email and, and sees the proposal. He does all the follow-up calls on the proposal. So, you know, our deal is that we promise the customer we'll get them their estimate within three business days. So we try to be Johnny on the spot with that. Dustin um, coordinates the remodel crews, the estimators, where they're going, what they're doing, um, how many days they're going to be in a job, if they're running ahead of schedule, behind schedule. Um, he collects the deposits for the bigger jobs. Uh, he'll order materials if, if instructed to by the remodel um, director. So he, he does a lot of that. Okay. And that, that's been very useful having him primarily function on that part of the business because that's roughly about half of our, our business. Roughly this year, two and a half million of it will be what we call remodel, which are just our little bit lengthier projects, typically over four or five days. Mm -hmm. And then the other remaining two and a half million come from handyman type jobs. Wow. So okay. Two or three day little jobs, one day jobs, whatever they may be as simple as hanging a TV to I'm going to paint three or four bedrooms and do a bunch of patches. Um, and then I guess that leaves me. Okay. So you sit on top of, of all that and kind of keep the ship moving. And I, and yeah. you know, we talked before you, this was, um, you know, you are doing so much in paving the way for the handyman industry. <laughs> and getting it up to up to what HVAC is, what plumbing is, uh, what a, a lot of most other home services are. And so I imagine because of that, 
you know, it's not like you can just reach out to another handyman company that, you know, in town or, you know, town next door and in, in a group somewhere that's also projected to do, you know, <laughs> they're trying to do 5 million, like, Hey, how are you structuring things? So, um, I get the feel like, you know, you're kind of just adjusting based on kind of what's coming into the business. And then also your experience in previous home service businesses. I'm guessing that has a lot to do with how, how you're structuring, uh, like the f- look, planning the future growth of the business. Yes. So to me, you know, my background's HVAC. So you have your service side and then you have your install side. Mm -hmm. And this, what we do is handyman, light remodeling, whatever you want to call it, is very, very similar. It's primarily customer service. And I think that's the biggest thing that handyman guys miss is customer service aspect of it. Because, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I took a notepad. When we, when we came up with this idea and I said, what do people hate? What do people not like about doing business with contractors and handyman? Mm-hmm. You know, my list consisted of, they don't answer their phone. They never call back. They don't show up when they say they're going to show up. You don't know who's coming to your house. Um, their vehicles aren't clean. The, the list goes on and on, but primarily it was communication type issues. Mm -hmm. right because the typical handyman guy it's really not his fault he's in a truck he's by himself he's trying to answer the phones buy the materials price the jobs do everything himself and there's just not enough bandwidth Um, I mean I've done it it's my third business to start from scratch so it's very 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 difficult Um, being bigger like this and having all these employees is difficult but in a completely different way So when we started this and and kind of go back into the handyman industry, I was like, I need to build systems and processes that are scalable. Mm -hmm. And I need to make sure that this list of stuff people don't like about doing business with us. My processes keep us from doing this. Right. We're still, it's still going to happen. 5% of the time we didn't call somebody back. You know, it, it's going to happen. If you're going to book 600 calls a month, you're going to forget to mm-hmm. call somebody back. It's just going <laughs> to happen. Um, but no, the this industry that we're in and in, in, in like what you guys are talking about is a wide open market. Mm-hmm. Everybody watching this podcast should be super excited because nobody is in this industry doing it. HVAC's built up. Electrical's pretty built up. You know, I got in the HVAC world, I got 150 competitors and Many of them are doing millions and millions of dollars a year in the Dallas Fort Worth market in heating and air conditioning. Mm-hmm. How many are doing millions of dollars a year in, in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex in, in handyman work? Mr. Handyman? Yeah, not a whole lot. I can't, <laughs> I can't find anybody else. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I've looked. So going back to what you guys said, um, my first post in the handyman network uh, was it business mastery. The uh, handyman mastermind group on Facebook. Yeah, thank you. Your your group there was me asking if anybody knows of anybody with a, a large handyman business that I could go visit. And man, I mean, love love everybody to death, but they beat me up pretty hardcore, telling me I was insane <laughs> and it doesn't exist. You can't do it. Yeah. 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 In my HVAC career, I've always networked with other large HVAC company owners, managers, and I will get on an airplane and fly to California and go ride with their techs, fill my brain with their processes and come back and implement and see what I can build mm-hmm. in. And, you know, that's why I'm kind of an open book now is because I've built my whole career off other entrepreneurs being open books and helping right. me with learn because there's no college to learn home trades, mm-hmm. right? You have a business degree. That's kind of useless for what we do unless you get into, you know, marketing and a mm-hmm. whole bunch of math stuff. But what we're doing, it it's wide open. We can build it however big you want. I imagine the next three years, this will be a $10 million a year handyman business. Mm-hmm. And I say that out of pure shock because <laughs> my goal originally was, hey, in the next, maybe in the next 15 or 20 years, by the time I retire, this thing can do $10 million a year in revenue. And wow. I think we'll do it in six, year six is if I can find the manpower. Yeah, that's fantastic. So- uh, my advice really to anybody watching this is you really have to decide what you want to do. 
Okay. Do you, and there's nothing wrong with your decision. If you're retired and you want to do handyman stuff uh, to supplement your income, that's great. That's perfect. That's the best for you. If you want to just have one or two guys because you hate managing people, which I get it, it's absolutely exhausting. Um, that is the route you got to go. But if you want to scale a business like this, and there's pros and cons to it, the risk, there's a lot more risk. Um, the pros is that I can go on vacation for two weeks and it runs like a champ. Right. I don't have to be here. Last mm -hmm. time I went on vacation for 10 days, I left. I took two phone calls. I checked my email. I came back. There was $100,000 more in the bank than when I left. They had fired a guy, hired two guys, put another guy in his truck. Wow. And I, I was like, I, who's that guy? He works here now? What's his name? <laughs> wow. That's awesome, which is, man. <laughs> which is great. But if you're going to scale a business, any business, you have to come into it with going, that's the plan. I'm going to scale it. Now, how am I going to do that? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of planning involved. You have to build a scalable pricing structure. You have to build a scalable call center. You have to script stuff. You have to get your policies and procedures on paper, pretty tight. They're never going to be perfect. Um, you can't leave it up to the individual in the truck to come up with his own pricing structure. Mm -hmm. they, you will be in the poor house. Yeah. You have to come up with a compensation plan that incentivizes your team out in the field to be as productive as possible and price jobs accordingly. Um, if you are re relying on hourly employees to go out and be as productive as possible and make the company profitable, I, I just don't see it happening. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So, can, can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, first, uh, mm -hmm. can you speak to like your pricing? Because I know that your pricing is probably way different than many other people do. If you could talk a little bit to that. And then also, I would love to hear about your compensation plan and how you encourage people. Because I know that's that's one common uh, concern is, hey, if I hire someone, how do I make sure they you know, are efficient and they actually do the work that needs to be done? So if you could talk a little bit to those two things, that'd be great. So my pricing structure for the handyman consists of one page. Hmm. This is my pricing structure. So I do not like billing hourly. I know I've seen this topic a hundred thousand times, and I'm sure you have been in the middle of plenty of those conversations. Yep. Yep. Billing hourly works great if you're one or two men. Okay. But as you scale your business and you want to be the most attractive employer you can to hire the best talent, you have to provide good vehicles, 401k, health insurance, paid vacation, paid holidays, like all that stuff is substantially expensive. Hmm. And then buildings and auto insurance and $9 a gallon gasoline. Uh, yeah. You know, my fuel bill last month was $10,000. I'm just oh, man. <laughs> freaking out. Um, but that being said, I built a pricing structure. It's literally, you know, different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty blurry, but, um, and it is based off time, but hourly, hourly is the taboo word here at Hank's Handyman. If I hear you saying hourly, it, it's not mentioned on the script. It's not on the phone. My handyman guys are told not to ever say the word hourly. Um, I hear every day people call and say, well, what do y'all charge hourly? And my call takers are like, you know, we don't charge hourly. We do charge a $69 dispatch fee to come out. We do waive that if your service is done same day. Um, we use that dispatch fee to rule out the tire kickers. Mm -hmm. We are a more expensive company. So chances are if they won't pay 69, that's going to be waived, which essentially makes it irrelevant. Right. If you're going to have the work done, the 69 goes away. Mm -hmm. then they're probably not going to be a customer that is really going to be attractive to us as a business. Yeah. They're just looking for a free estimate. Right. And we may not be attractive to them once we actually give them their prices. Mm -hmm. So we use that dispatch fee for that reason. Now uh, the pricing structure, we're selling time. That's what we do as handyman. Um, you know, you can make a price for the 15 different components of a toilet if you want, but how are you going to train, how are you going to train somebody on the, the 2000 different tasks that we could do as a handyman day to day? Mm -hmm. 
like you you know you're gonna need a book mm-hmm. and i've seen this in in other industries hvac and electrical where they have a, a flat rate price book and it's literally like 200 pages long and you have to go through and and find okay plumbing okay toilet okay this part mm-hmm. right that's just over complicated you can't scale that so essentially what i did is i track everything everything mm-hmm. I, numbers materials i know how much we spent on screws at this job we track everything that being said i knew that my material cost was about 10.5 percent last year mm-hmm. as a whole so I built in 12% into my pricing structure for all truck stock items. So okay. if it comes off a truck, it's included here. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason I did that is because several things. I don't like having the conversation with customers about marking up my materials. Right. I mm-hmm. don't want the customer going and shopping for my materials because they always buy the wrong stuff or they don't buy enough. Mm -hmm. I want to take out as much negative communication as possible out of the experience. So if I tell you that I'm going to, you know, it's uh, $647 to uh, paint this room includes uh, up to one patch. It includes paint materials, labor, uh, plastic, caulk, like all your uh, truck stock items, plus the two gallons of paint, whatever it may be. Um, there's a lot of perceived value with that. Most homeowners don't know what all that stuff costs Mm -hmm. for one. They don't know if it's $50 worth of material or $200 worth of material. On top of that, they don't feel like you're going to nickel and dime them. Like, Hey, I had to charge you $3 for a tube of caulk. Right. (laughs) Oh, plus I got to mark it up 30%. Well, why'd you mark it up 30%? Mm -hmm. Right. I'd rather just avoid the whole conversation and just, we build that stuff in. So my guys know that, you know, uh, I'll literally run through what we do. So we, we go into the home. Okay. We do what we call a to-do list. And if you see, you know, the pricing says your to-do list at the top, mm-hmm. which we all do. We walk into the house, we make notes of what the customer wants done. Then from there, we figure out how to price them. So from there, we, we do what's, uh, we do different bundles. So if it's, you know, three items in a room, we may do all the cart. We may bundle different things together. Um, if we bundle all of it together, we kind of give them a reduced rate because they're doing more work with us. Mm-hmm. Um, we also offer financing on our bigger bundles as well. So we have 12 and 18 months fin- zero interest financing options, okay. which is, is probably a whole nother ball game in the handyman world. But if you're going to live in the house for 10 years, or you're going to have me out here four times over the next year, why don't we go ahead and take care of all these items now? It's $3,500. We can do an 18 month zero interest. It's $125 a month, whatever it may be. How's that sound? Would you like me to go ahead and get started? Type situation. Wow. But, you know, the pricing structure, based off the skill level and the time that it's going to take to do the job, that's how we figure out what level we do. So if I go through and we'll use the same scenario, I'm going to paint a bedroom, install a ceiling fan, and patch a wall. Okay. Mm that's going to take me eight hours on average. It's going to take me all day. So what I'm going to do is as a handyman, I'm going to charge a level eight here, which for us is $1,799, right? Um, Mm -hmm. That includes all your materials, except for the ceiling, what we call decor items, which would be ceiling fan, anything pretty Mm -hmm. that the customer, it's going to be to the customer's taste, but that would include this, installation of the ceiling fan with a three-year workmanship warranty. So if any reason that ceiling fan falls down, gets loose or anything else, we'll come back, um, we'll paint the walls. We'll use all the truck stock items, like I said earlier. And, you know, Mr. Homeowner, if that sounds good to you, I go ahead and go get materials and get started today. So we have them sign off on that $17.99 and we go get the materials and get started. Okay. Now, if it's, Say they sell a two-day or three-day job, we typically don't start that same day, um, especially if it's in the afternoon. We'll just call the office. We'll set up a date for me to come do what we call a job return, and we'll set that up, and then that same handyman will go back out there at a further date and do the job over whatever time frame that he sold. Okay. Um, 
my compensation structure ties directly with these. So each one of these items has a, a, a pay base mm -hmm. um, based on skill level. So my level one handyman, he gets paid $30 per task hour that he bills. Um, yeah. No, 30. Yeah. I think it's $25 per billable hour for my level one. Mm -hmm. Man, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 25 per task hour from my level two, $30 per task hour from my level, yeah, my level two, and 35 from my level three. So it's a $5 increments. So as, it, as you increase your skill level and the way you get promoted, the way you earn more money is by increasing your knowledge, increasing your communication skills, and as you move up from a level one to a two and a two to a three, you kind of develop a career path for somebody who is inevitably going to come in and say, how do I make more money? Well, we increase your skills, mm -hmm. right? You want to make $35 per billable hour, increase your skills. Let's get you up to level three. Um, what does that take? What skills do we need to do? Um, we kind of have that conversation and then we kind of develop a training plan uh, for example, if a handyman wants to learn some tile skills, we may put him on a remodel job at his hourly base pay for a week or two or two or three jobs, you know, however long it takes mm -hmm. to put him on the job and get hands-on training to increase his skill base. So that hourly base pay, that's different from the billable pay? Yes. Yeah, so they, everybody does have an hourly base pay. Um, the only time they really work on that is um, training. For example, you know, like I just said, we're sending them on a tile job for a week to learn additional skills or if they're on a warranty job. So if we have a call back and they got to go back, then they work off their hourly pay base. Um, typically, if they're producing revenue, the company can afford to pay more money than if we're working on a warranty where we're losing our tail on it every single hour. So is that is that based on that uh, per billable hour? Is that based on a certain metric or is it just per hour that they're out there working? Because how do you know that they are efficient for that hour, right? Like they could be hammering a nail for an hour, but they're not necessarily making you an hour's worth of billable hours, right? Like do you guys have a certain metric for that? Um, so considering that their pay is tied to their billable hour, mm -hmm if you're dumb enough to stay in there for an hour and hammer a nail, you're actually losing money as the handyman in the home. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I learned that people auto correct way faster. If it's, if they've got some skin in the game. Right. Right. If I'm an hourly technician and it takes me an hour to hammer a nail, I really don't care because mm -hmm. I got my $25. Right. Um, if I, if I said that this was going to take me anywhere from seven to nine hours to complete, so I build a level eight and it okay. took me 11 hours, I got paid for eight because that's what I, I build the customer. I see. If it took me 11, then in my mind as the technician in the field, I'm going, man, why did this take so long? Did I underprice it? Um, was, was there something unexpected that come up that I couldn't really overcome? Um, you know, if I did underprice it, next time I see this, situation i know that this is going to take me longer than what i thought so the human nature with this pay structure guys seem to auto correct way faster um Chater there uh ben i just want to point out for everybody is like your technician these handymen they're going out and they are the ones that are saying like this is an eight hour job so that's because uh, in most kind of uh, right. setups you have the estimator that goes out and then the handyman's a whole different person that was not involved until they got to the job or is the owner bidding and then the technician goes out. So um, they have that authority and, and the buck's kind of on them. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. So you're right. The biggest difference is that these guys go out, they're making their to-do list. And as they're doing this, like if, you know, Hey, Mr. Allen, you want this bedroom painted here? Um, do you already know what the paint color is? Yes. Okay. Well, do you already have the paint? Well, if they say yes, how much paint do you have? And in <laughs> my mind, I'm making a 
and I, I'm get, trying to get an idea of what it's good. How long is this going to take me to do this? Mm -hmm. If, you know, Mr. Allen says that I don't have the paint. Okay. Well, that's no problem. I can go get that for you. Do you have your color picked out? Oh, you got your paint sample. Great. I know that I'm in this town and the, the place nearest place for me to go get paint. It's going to take me an hour to go get paint, come back. So I'm going to count that into my estimated job time. You know, if it's going to take me four hours to paint this and an hour to go get the materials, I'm going to quote this as a minimum of a level five job mm -hmm. because it's how long it's going to take me. See, we don't tell the customer it's going to take five hours. We say, you know, hey, Miss, Mr. Allen, uh, in order to get this done with all your materials and everything else, this is $1,077. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's going to take me anywhere from four to six hours to complete this is about the standard time to do this. And, you know, sign here, I'll get on my way and go get the materials. So we always give a ballpark because in reality, is it really going to take you five hours? I don't know. It could take me yeah. four. It could take me six. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reality of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I, you, you have to be able to come up with a scalable pricing structure. I mean, that's the real big pinch. Um, is the pricing structure so so if if you're paying your handyman per billable hour right and say say they sell a job for eight hours whatever it is on that sheet um and it takes them 11 hours do they only get paid that eight hours at say the 25 dollars an hour per billable hour rate or do they get those extra two hours on their non-billable hour rate you they know like how paid. does that work like especially with labor board and all that <laughs> well in texas they can get paid the eight hours. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. And, and that's one of the things, but here's the flip side to that. If they sell something for 10 hours and it mm -hmm. takes them eight and they still get paid the 10. Right. Because I do allow them to oversell time on mm -hmm. higher skilled jobs. Mm -hmm. um, in our area, finding a high skilled tile guy, is extremely difficult, especially one that can pass a drug test and has a driver's mm -hmm. license. It's extremely. It took me 18 months to hire a tile guy that I could keep. Mm. Um, that is a higher skill level. There is more perceived value with that skill set than a guy who can paint a wall, mm -hmm. at least with our customer base. So, you know, a lot of times, if it's going to take eight hours, we'll sell it for 10, 11, because it is a more difficult task. And people are happy to pay it because if I can't hire a tile guy, no, the customers can't either. They've already had mm -hmm. two or three people. They didn't show up, everything else. So, you know, I know some people are going to say, you're, you're ripping the customer off. Here's my theory. I'm in business for profit. I'm providing a high level service. Right. I have lots of overhead. My customer paid our, approved our price up front, paid our price. They have a three-year workmanship warranty and no hassle. If you call and say you're up, you're unhappy with it, anybody who answers the phone will book a warranty call and send somebody out. You don't even have to talk to a manager. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, you, you left me a five-star review somewhere saying how great we were. Yes, we were expensive, but we answered the phone. We showed up on time and the technician was awesome. Mm -hmm. That is a win to me all day long. Definitely. You know, so... Is it ripping off your customer for a higher skill set, a happy customer who's going to leave you a five-star review and use you multiple times? I don't think so. That's a happy mm -hmm. customer. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I like to compare ourselves to the Mercedes Benz of handyman. Hmm. Um, it's a it. car. It has four wheels. Why do people pay more money for Mercedes Benz than they do a Ford? A, 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 <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> it used to be Kia. I used to use Kia. Kia's You're either nice. Mercedes Benz or a Ford, right? I'll take the Ford all day, personally. I've got a <laughs> bunch of them in the parking lot and my, two of them in my garage. So, yeah, I mean, so not every customer is going to pay for the Mercedes Benz price. Mm -hmm. They just want a car, right? So, not every customer is going to pay Hank's handyman price. And that's okay mm -hmm. because there's 15%, 20% of the population that that's what they want. Mm -hmm. They want to have a one phone call. They want the guy to show up. They want to get yep. the job done. They'll leave you a great review and then they're done with you. Mm -hmm. um, then you got the other customer who will call five different people 
to save $22 mm-hmm. right. and then yeah. complain about the service. So yeah, they're not going to be happy no matter what, you know, they're not going to be a, happy at a hundred dollars and they're not going to be happy at $500. <laughs> I have a, I have a saying that you don't negotiate with terrorists because at yes. the end of the day, you still get blown up. Like that's, that's a it, great you one. Know? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's going to happen, but you know, I think our busy, biggest success is I can take a guy and teach him our pricing structure in a week, mm-hmm. essentially. The biggest question is, how long is it going to take you to do it? Okay, correspond that with this. Mm-hmm. And are your materials 10% or less? Because we will charge for additional materials. For example, the number one re- repair that we do where we charge for additional materials is replacing a front or rear door. Mm-hmm. Like the the price it varies widely. You could have a two hundred dollar right. door or a two thousand dollar door. Yeah. <laughs> so typically, what we'll do is we quote labor only, or labor and all materials other than the door. Mm-hmm. So if the door is eight hundred fifty dollars and it's going to take us four hours, we quote a level four at nine fifty eight. That includes all the labor, the shims. It includes the moldings and the finish on the moldings. So, and then if you have an eight hundred fifty dollar door at Home Depot, we charge you eight hundred fifty, and we'll be happy to go pick it up and bring it here. Hmm. Right. That, that, that's great. So See, what is, now what I don't have that... to, now I don't have to explain that I marked up your $850 door, dollar door 30%. Right. 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 Yeah. My price is a little higher, but it includes all this. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to install it. If in two and a half years from now, it doesn't shut good. Call us. We'll come out and make adjustments. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, that's awesome. Um, so what does, what type of like transition a little bit, how does that, go into like what kind of estimating software you use right because it's one thing to tell the people like okay this is the price 756 bucks but on the estimate like the actual written estimate that you write on the computer do you actually break that down labor and materials or is it just one line item for the whole thing you know what does that look like and and what estimating software do you use by the way we actually handwrite all of our estimates wow i did not think that okay yes (laughs) um we're going to change we're using a, a, a service called successware mm-hmm. which is horribly outdated it's not good i don't recommend it um <laughs> we just made the decision last week we're going to switch to something called sera s-e-r-a okay and i have not looked into that too hard yet um one of the other it guys was with it because there are five companies and we're all like in the same compound mm-hmm. so we all share best business practices technology um You know, we meet once a month to go over all of our financials, tell us what's working, what's not working, where we're having problems, because the problems we have are the same problems they're having. Mm -hmm. Just like the problems I have as a handyman business, you guys have a lot of them as well. Yep, yep. And I think that's why business owners notoriously, it's almost like you're, as soon as you find out, oh, that guy's a business owner, you like open your arms and bring them into your family right away because you feel come for talk them. talk to me, yes. You immediately feel for them. Come, 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 come right. cry on my shoulder. Cry right here, right here, buddy. <laughs> I know you had a bad day. Nobody appreciates you. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're handwriting our estimates. A lot of our clientele are older. Mm-hmm. Um, they have more expendable cash and, and that's kind of who we try to market to, 40 mm-hmm. and up. Um, we are going to be moving over the next six months to more of a digital estimating software. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, I, it's too soon for me to speak on that mm-hmm. really. Um, okay. So then when you write it up, when they write it up, I guess they just write one line item, right? Like paint this bedroom, blah, 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 675. That's it. Yeah. So, you okay. know, it could be uh, paint bedroom, two coats of paint, ABC, uh, patch this wall, fill all nail holes, prep space, like something like that. Um, three-year workmanship warranty, and then additional materials, customer supply door, $845. Okay. okay. Right. Here's your total due upon completion. Mm-hmm. And do you guys, do you guys charge any type of deposit or you just get money when it's done? So we charge deposits on jobs over 10,000. Okay. And what's that so, deposit? Is it percentage 10% or what? Yeah. So if, if anybody quotes a job over uh, 10,000, it goes through a whole, it goes through a whole separate process, mm-hmm. which is what our estimating process is. So they may handwrite an estimate. Um, Dustin, who is our, uh, what did I call him? 
or remodel coordinator. Yeah, uh, yeah I think yeah. I think so. Yes, remodel. Yeah, fairly new title here. Yeah, okay. A lot of moving parts. <laughs> remodel coordinator. He'll take that proposal. He'll type it up into our our platform, and then he'll email it out, and then he'll kind of do the follow through if it's signed. We immediately get a, a notification saying that, hey, this customer just signed this proposal. He'll actually call the customer, um, collect a one third deposit. Once we receive the deposit, we go ahead and put it on the schedule. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, we get with the uh, project manager. We send all the job notes to him and he'll start ordering material and, and prepping for the job. And typically those jobs are two or three weeks out because um, we're almost always two or three or four weeks out on those bigger projects. Okay. So, okay. and then we do one third on acceptance of proposal, um, one third at halfway and remaining balance on completion, which includes um, any change orders or anything else that happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's pretty much standard. And we have, I would say that we've had one job where we collected a deposit on that canceled. Mm-hmm probably in two wow. years okay so once we cool. collect the deposit and put them on the schedule it's pretty firm yeah they're usually now, ev yeah everything's in writing um we use hello sign actually for that so we have a okay. template built in there and and that's how we can see if a customer's opened it or if they haven't opened it mm -hmm. so if they okay. don't open it within 24 hours we call the customer because chances are that they think we didn't send it and it's in their spam box so that's why i like hello sign because we did have a problem in the beginning of where we had sent proposals and we'd never hear back from customers and we'd wonder what happened. Mm -hmm. And then later we'd send an email marketing blast or a customer base. And then we get mm -hmm. all these emails about how these people didn't receive their <laughs> estimates. And they literally thought that we just right. did Blue a standard mom. contractor thing and we left them hanging. Yeah. In reality, uh, Hank's was, handyman. <laughs> yeah. In reality, we sent it. They just didn't see it. Right. Um, right. So, we switched over to the hello sign so that way we could see it they were open okay and then we built a whole entire sales tracking platform in monday.com mm -hmm. so we run all of our estimates we enter them in there we have a setup so if we know the proposal status whether it's been sent whether it's we haven't received it from the estimator yet um, if it was open when it was opened we do how many times would we call them if they said no why so we have that whole entire system built into monday.com. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, just and then we track our whole entire remodel process in there too. Uh, that's a huge missed opportunity. I see a lot of uh, a lot of business owners like not taking advantage of, especially when they get to that three to five man like Mark and they're and they're and they're trying to scale and figure out the next step is 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 tracking in a project management software. So monday.com, uh, Trello, ClickUp, those are all really great. Uh, uh, I think they have free offerings for a lower level, but just to kind of get you introduced, but um, it's a great uh, system to roll out to really track, um, you know, where, where those estimates are at, especially for remodelers, any kind of large jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's awesome. Well, um, I know we're kind of getting low on time here and we got a whole are, bunch what? of questions to ask you, yeah. like, but, so I think we're going to definitely have to have a part two for this, for this. Yeah, we, uh, haven't even, we haven't even talked marketing. I know, dude. Yeah, I know. Marketing is like the number one question I wanted to ask you. So, right, first question, Ben. <laughs> I know you got to eat lunch, man, because it's like twelve o'clock and of our time, and we want to respect your time. Uh, do you? Yeah, you it's good. Like, uh, like five, ten minutes, or yeah, go whatever you got. Okay. Cool, cool. Well, yeah. One question I had was: so a typical marketing budget is like seven, eight percent of gross revenue, and I believe, like based off your numbers, you're making somewhere around like four hundred, four hundred thousand a month, correct? Bringing in. Yeah. Three fifty okay, so, to four hundred in revenue. So that would be somewhere around like twenty eight, thirty thousand a month spent on marketing. How much do you actually spend on marketing, and where do you spend that? That's so my we, question. our but our marketing budget is five percent. Okay. Um, that's fairly low as a marketing budget goes mm -hmm. because um, the repeat business opportunity with what we do as handyman is huge. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of how often somebody needs an electrician or needs a how often their HVAC breaks it's not near as often as they could use somebody like us in their home. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of repeat business. We get a lot of referrals. Um, and then um, if you know anybody that works at a home service company that does electrical plumbing or heating and air conditioning, you need to go talk to the people in charge there and you need to figure out how to go fix all their oops jobs. <laughs> so um, we incentivize the partner company, which is called Milestone Electric, 
we incentivize all their technicians to send us leads. Hmm. So if a plumber goes into a house and uh, does a repipe, cuts 30 holes in the walls, he's on the phone calling us when he's at the home saying, hey, I just cut a bunch of holes in the wall. This customer needs an estimate to get all this fixed. Um, When can you guys come out? Mm -hmm. So, and then we we partnered with them and we pay each of their technicians a 3% referral fee for any sold work. Hmm. So if you can work your way in or you have those kind of connections, um, we do 300, 350,000 a year in revenue just from that one, that one connection. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Man. That's great, man. So, but, that but, is. but the leads are phenomenal because, mm-hmm. you know, they, we run very similar to the other company as far as our business structure. So if that customer chose to do business with them, they would also probably choose to do business with us. Mm-hmm. So that, that is a great, you know, little marketing thing. If, if you're around, you, you know, take a day, if you're slow, go to the home service companies and, and try mm-hmm. to, you know, figure out who's doing their repairs. Right. Um, That's huge, man. Yep. Huge. You should do that. That's great repeat business. And once you get that established relationship, you just need to maintain it, you know, take it mm-hmm. out to lunch every quarter or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? Where else do you spend? Marketing? Oh, marketing. Yeah. Uh, PPC on Google. So pay-per-click. Okay. Um, LSA has actually been local service ads has been way more productive and cheaper than PPC. Hmm. So if you're on Google, but you are not using local service ads, you should sign up. We're getting leads for about $35 a lead. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, the other thing is if you're not getting reviews, you need to get every review. I, I told a guy a few weeks ago that I was talking to that you as a handyman guy, and if you're watching this, you need to get on Google and you need to see who everybody in the handyman market is around you. And you need to see who has the most reviews and the highest rating. Mm-hmm. And then you need to set your goal to beat them. Beat them. Right. <laughs> beat them. I have, I, I don't know. I, I probably have 515 Google reviews at 4.9. Mm-hmm. Um, nice when we started 24, system. what? You use like nice job or another kind of uh, reputation management system to kind of automate that? We're using a service called Pulse M. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's automated in our software. So when we dispatch a technician, you get a technician bio, which is his picture, a few things about him personally, and then you get um, a list of his most current customers and what they said about him. Mm -hmm. That's kind of part of building trust, building rapport, building value. That's that's awesome. Ever get to the house. And then as soon as he leaves, you get a review link via text message and email asking how we did with mm-hmm. a link to our Facebook and our Google. Okay. And do you, and so do you uh, do anything else than Google? No. No? Okay. That's Matter of awesome. fact, we, we, turn, we have to turn Google off. Mm-hmm. It's off right now. <laughs> um, we turn it on for two weeks, then we get booked out for two weeks, then we turn it back off for a few weeks. Wow. So we've been spending roughly fourteen to 15000 a month. Mm-hmm. Um, I did learn in January and February, kind of the slower months of the year that we got to spend quite a bit more in marketing to get the phone to ring. I think that just comes back to there's just less demand in January and February right. than there is the rest of the year when the weather's nicer. Mm-hmm. So as soon as middle of March kicked it around, we're like, okay, well, turn all the marketing off. So all the stuff we spent, we overspent in January and February. Now we'll underspend in probably March, April, and May. Dude. Killer, but massive gap in supply and demand of like, there's just not a, there's just no supply of professional handyman service. that's going to answer the phone, show up on time, provide that great customer experience. And yes. demand is out there. I think you mentioned, you know, maybe like 15%, 40 plus, like those are the people that demand, they really want to find Hank's handyman and, and other similar professional uh, companies like yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The demand is unbelievable i Mm -hmm. i can't really tell you what this business is going to do anymore i did i don't think i understood the demand when we did this i was like oh yeah there'll be some people you know we'll grow it we'll scale it um if i actually went full blast like marketing like mailers and radio and everything man we'd be so covered up people would be Mm -hmm. hanging up oh they're already hanging up on us because they don't want to wait two weeks right right so I know one big question I had for you, Ben, uh, well, we've got another five minutes here, maybe, um, is hiring. Like, I, that's a huge struggle that a lot of people have. And you, you mentioned, uh, you know, you lost six guys over the last couple of months. Um, what, 
what do you what does your hiring look like? Um, and, and also piggyback question is I'm curious what the average tenure of your techs are. Uh, also understanding you're only three years in business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. August first will be three three years. Mm -hmm. um, man, if I could figure out that that question um, <laughs> a year a year ago was substantially easier than now. Mm -hmm. um, a year ago, I could I could get pretty good guys for twenty five bucks an hour in my market. Um, everybody wanted 401k health insurance. They wanted all the benefits that you get with typically the bigger organizations. And that was enough to get people to come on board. Um, it does not seem to be the case anymore. Hmm. Um, I got to the point where I'm like, uh, we just threw out a $2,000 hiring bonus for top tier guys. Wow. Um, I decided, you know what, if I can't get people, because my top tier guys, my level three guys, they're averaging between 30 and $41 per hour. And that's not just billable hour. That's per every hour that they're at work in their mm -hmm. van at Home Depot. So I just figured it takes a guy anywhere from six to eight weeks to get in a truck, get trained and get in his groove if he has the experience before he's making that money. So I, I'm kind of desperate. So I was like, you know, maybe I try to offer them $30 an hour with a $2,000 hiring bonus. Hmm. And I've managed to scoop up two or three that way in the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I still probably need to hire like seven more. I have six empty trucks in the parking lot, not producing any money, Wow, which is devastating. <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah, hiring's tough. So I actively recruit. So I go through ZipRecruiter and Indeed, of course I have posts on there, but I don't get the response out of the post as near as much as I do as going through their resume database. Mm -hmm. um, I will literally, people. yes, yeah. okay. call, literally calling them on the phone. Here's resumes right now. I spent two yeah. hours doing that this morning, texting them, calling them on the phone, actively, in this market, you're going to have to actively pursue people. Um, almost be a persistent pain in the ass, excuse mm -hmm. me. <laughs> but you got to be very diligent right now. You just really have to work work through it. It's, mm -hmm. it's really tough. That's Real awesome, tough. Man. Well, as we, as we kind of get ready to close here, um, what, uh, what kind of advice would you have for people out there listening? I mean, first for the guy that's like just starting, um, what kind of advice would you have for him? First and foremost, just starting, know that it's hard. <laughs> it is very difficult. Um, you get what you put into it you got to figure out what you want and then you have to plan for it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not planning and, and you're not taking, you know, take a day or two, a quarter and get out of the field with a notepad and think about your business. I'm like, what do I want? How am I going to get there? How am I going to do it? I spend, I spend a whole week in October. I will go work somewhere else. I'll work at home, working on my budget, working on my plan. How many trucks do I need? How much, Revenue can I produce per truck? So if I want to hit 5 million, well, how many guys do I need? Right. Well, how am I going to buy those trucks? How am I going to get the guys? Um, you really, really have to plan. So what's my overhead cost? You'll buy line item, buy account, billing account category. It, 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 it's, it's tough mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, this stuff doesn't happen by accident. It's, it's very, very well planned and thought out. And then you have to follow your plan, which following your plan means adjusting your plan every single time you hire somebody and then they quit on you. <laughs> right. Uh, well, like that didn't work. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I got very, very lucky. My first hire is still here. His name's Guillermo. He's doing a great job. Um, and then, nice. yeah. And I'm, so I've got probably four guys that have been here two years or over, which for only being two and a half years, a little over two and a half years in business, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I, My higher skilled guys stay longer than my entry level guys is mm -hmm. what I'm finding because my higher skilled guys are making 95 plus thousand, 95 to 105,000 a year with all the benefits and my lower skilled guys, you know, 45 to 65. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this market, they're a little bit more poachable than my higher skilled guys who are making more money. So 
that that seems to be the trend that I've, I'm noticing. I don't have a whole lot of handyman business uh, time to notice a lot more trends, mm -hmm. but that's just what I've noticed so far. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, and something I want to repeat too, I, I believe Ben, you mentioned this uh, kind of before we, we started the episode and we we're just talking, but, um, and, it, and it, it, you really kind of hit on it with, with this like last few advices plan out, but know what you're trying to accomplish. Like you mentioned the retired guy that wants to make supplement income. That's great. Know that that's what you're going to do. And there's definitely opportunity. You know, do you want to just have one or two guys and cause you don't want to manage people or do you want to be a Hank's handyman? It, you know, there's just mm -hmm. different sets of problems with each one, but you know, planning for what kind of what, what you want, setting those goals, uh, super important to dial in what you're going for mm -hmm. because there's multiple ways to do it. Yeah, I mean, because if, if you don't plan for it, next thing you know, it's going to be two, three, five, ten years down the road, and you're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to scale my business now. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you yep. just spent ten years doing this. Why didn't you do it ten years ago? Yep. You know, you you, you got to plan. If it's a five year plan, make it a five year plan. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't write it down and you don't think it through, it's probably not going to happen. Yep, that's huge. And gotta, I think one thing I took from what you said uh, way at the beginning of this podcast was track everything. I think that's such a key, and I think that's something that people don't do, and they lose out on it, right? Even your – like definitely your expenses, right? What you How spend do you know on, if you're priced correctly yeah, if you, you don't know what your margin was on every single know. job? People are, people might be like, wow, I made uh, I made eight grand this month. Well, how much did you spend? You know, I mm -hmm. come to find out you spend 10 grand, right? Then you aren't making right. any money. And so <laughs> I think I mean, tracking perfect everything example, is... perfect example. January, we did about 400,000 revenue. We made about $75,000 in net profit. February, February is tough. We had some ice and some weather. We lost six working days. So what did we do? I think about 260. We mm -hmm. made about $18,000 in net profit. March, we did 357. And it looks like we probably lost like five grand in March. Hmm. Because I track everything, yep. I know that my labor went from 25 to 30 percent. So I need mm -hmm. to go find out why my labor went higher. I, mm -hmm. I know why my labor went higher. I'm shorthanded and a lot of guys work more overtime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my materials went from 10 to 14 yep. percent. Um, my vehicle expenses went from two thousand dollars in repairs to fourteen thousand dollars in repairs. Well, and fuel. <laughs> fuel went from 6,000 to 10,000. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I, but I literally can look at reports and go, that number's supposed to be there. It's mm -hmm. higher. And then dive into the why. Mm -hmm. And it may be because I spent all that money. I ordered $4,000 for the uniforms. I hired mm -hmm. three guys. I upped my spending on my recruiting, like all the stuff is like, okay, well, I didn't really lose money. Mm -hmm. I more so invested in the growth. Right. That will return dividends in three months from now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I know people say, well, it's a big business and you bet, you know, it's not worth the hassle. I mean, we can prop, we can make net profit a half million dollars. And that's after I get a salary and all the bills are paid this year. That's, that's worth it. And I could be gone a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I won't be gone a month, but it could <laughs> happen one day. That's awesome. Well, uh, as we wrap up here, uh, Ben, just want to say thank you so much uh, for coming on. No problem. And uh, I, we've had, we have so much to talk about still. Uh, so uh, I want the viewers that are listening here to write in the comment section below, what's one thing you took away from Ben and what's one thing you would like him to talk about on the part two of this podcast. So uh, go ahead and leave that in the comment. And um, Ben, we want you to join the, uh, the Handyman Success Mastermind group on Facebook. You may already be a part of it. I'm not sure. Um, but that's where we have all of our guests from the podcast go and join so that the viewers can get on there and ask you specific questions. So one thing I would absolutely love is if you would be willing to post that pricing guide in that mastermind group would be fantastic and then have people ask you questions about that. I think that that would really help a lot of people kind of understand at least the pricing structure that you presented today. I think that would be fantastic. So uh, we'll, we'll get you in there. We'll, we'll send you the link to that. And also the viewers, we want you to know that we appreciate you guys Join us on that Handyman Success Mastermind group on Facebook. That link will be in the description of this podcast. Um, if you want to watch, we have tons of episodes of this podcast. So go on YouTube, Spotify, wherever you listen to or watch podcasts and check those out. So, Ben, do you have any final words for the viewers here before we head out? Uh, no, not really. Thanks Alrighty. for giving me the opportunity. And I hope that something I said 
helps somebody or maybe opens up their their thought process to thinking a little bit differently because you the future is what you make it with handyman and you really just have to decide what you want to do with it and then just go get it the market's not full so Mm -hmm. that's it that's all i got bam mic drop thank you guys for tuning in you guys have a fantastic day we'll catch you on the next next handyman success